Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Tonight we're going to be discussing homelessness and a Bemidji project that is poised to great break ground this spring as construction begins on a 60-unit supportive housing project. While it might seem like we're focusing on Bemidji tonight, homelessness is an issue that affects hundreds of families throughout our area. Think on this for one minute. In the triennial statewide homeless survey conducted by the Wilder Research out of St. Paul, they found that there was an increase in homeless individuals from 2009 to 2012 in the 12 county Northwest Minnesota region, and it increased by 170%. They found that there were 666 homeless individuals that year, 2012, in that region. We're going to look at, take a look at those stats and some of that data as we move forward tonight. But first, I want you to watch this short video. This will kind of introduce and illustrate the issue as we move forward tonight. Thank you. I've been an active alcoholic for about 29 years and um, the last decade or so of my drinking was really bad. I thought of myself as a functional alcoholic for a long time, but toward the end I was completely unable to take care of my normal daily living. I had recently lost two jobs in a row. Um, my mom had helped me with rent and I knew that I was pretty much going to be evicted from my apartment. The challenges of homelessness are, are overwhelming. Some of it relates to mental health issues and some of it might relate to chemical dependency issues. Um, some of it relates to a, a shot of bad luck. I had attempted suicide and I ended up in Generos and um, while I was in there my former husband had heard about Silver Creek, which had recently opened in Rochester. And I really didn't feel like I had anywhere else or better to go, so I decided I would go give it a try. Center City Housing, they're willing to serve some of the hardest people to serve. Where I'm standing right now at Silver Creek Corner, um, they serve folks with chronic alcohol issues who are homeless. We had no options for them prior to Center City coming. And because of the commitment to these folks and the service model they have in place, We've seen um, all of our outcomes that we hoped would happen, um, happen over the last several years. What I've learned very, very quickly, and my learning curve was very steep, we needed to build a culture and have a culture of caring in this organization. What can we do in terms of providing not only housing, but that caring atmosphere and, and the caring culture where um, our staff is sending that message 24-7. What we really try to promote is sober activities with the residents try to make them feel normal. I was just playing chess with a resident and he just straight up, he just started crying. He said he haven't played chess in a long time and he have not speaking to a, another person for a long time on like a social level. I've always had a passion for homeless. My father instilled in me to treat others with the same kindness that I would want to have treated towards me. The residents who have come in off the streets, who have lost all connection with maybe reality due to the fact of their chemical dependency, to me they're still human beings and they still have purpose in their life. One part of being homeless that is probably so very important and one thing that I hope we help solve in terms of an issue and that's um, people who are seen by other people in our, in our communities as being less than their counterparts and uh, we try to provide dignity in every uh, one of the buildings that we own and operate um, and dignity is so important to all of us and for us to not address those issues in our housing programs would be um, wouldn't be something we should do. I want to introduce you to our guests this evening. First, we have Rick Clun, the Executive Director of Center City Housing out of Duluth. And then we also have Tim Flathers, the Executive Director of the Headwaters Regional Development Commission here in Bemidji. Thanks Welcome. For having us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So first, Rick, perhaps you'd be willing to give us just a brief history, a little bit of background on Center City and the type of work that it's done. Sure. Center City Housing is a 501c3 not-for-profit 
organization that was incorporated in 1986, so just about 30 years ago in Duluth, Minnesota. And um, our mission is to serve people in terms of housing that have the, the least means and the most needs. And we've been doing that successfully for 30 years. Okay, have you been with them the whole time? I have not. Okay. I, I started working at Center City in 2004. 2004, okay, great. And Tim, would you give us a little bit of a history at HRDC, what its role is with homelessness specifically? Sure, HRDC is a five county regional development organization and we do planning as well. And we've been around since 1971 and we're committed to helping make communities as good as they can be. And one of the components of that is affordable housing and safe shelter. And um, so we try to do, you know, play a role that we can in helping make that happen. So tell me a little bit, Rick, were you invited to come to Bemidji or did Center City take an interest in Bemidji or how does it that Center City came to have a connection to Bemidji? Um, we were invited okay. would be the short answer. Um, Center City got into a, a new arena back in 2004. That's okay. about the time I started and it's called Permanent Supportive Housing. Mm -hmm. And um, we opened a project called the New San Marco. We developed it and opened it and um, it's become a model not only throughout um, the state of Minnesota, but throughout the nation. And uh, about five years ago, the Beltrami County HRA invited us to come up and talk about what we're doing. And then we talked about, could we help in, in Beltrami County and the surrounding areas? Okay, and San Marco is in Duluth, correct? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, and is it the only facility you have in Duluth or how many do you have kind of that are operating out there? You know, I think we've got a total of about 18 buildings in Minnesota. Okay. Uh, and we have about 600 units of housing. Um, our programs for chronic alcoholics and for homeless single adults are in Duluth, in Rochester, Minnesota, in St. Cloud, and soon to be in Bemidji. Okay, so I'm understanding that you guys have been talking for about five years since you came to the HRA, but I want to focus a little bit on the, what started happening in 2013 moving forward, and that was, I saw like the needs assessment for when you really started to take a hard look at the population and what the needs are. And I just wanted to say a few things. I know I talked a little bit, there was a 100% increase in homeless from 09 to 12. Um, they also found during that needs assessment that there were 262 homeless children in the school district, and that was up as well. And then you found that there was hundreds of people on waiting lists for Section 8, the, the rental assistance programs. Is that the kind of figures that start getting you guys thinking that there needs to be something in place to help these people? That's, that's kind of legitimizes what we do. Um, what really grabbed us was driving into Duluth and in, <laughs> into Bemidji and seeing homeless people. Okay. And we, we, every trip we came into town, we saw homeless single adults. And um, we, in every community that we do a project, we do a needs assessment. And um, we were shocked by the numbers of homeless people in, in Bemidji, Beltrami County and the surrounding areas. Tim, you've been here for years. Were you surprised by the numbers? when the needs assessment came back? I, I would say I was a little bit surprised. Um, anecdotally, you always know there's a need, but when you start seeing the numbers and you start seeing the numbers within different areas, um, um, it, it, it does catch you a little bit off guard that the need is so great. And um, we, we, just as a, to enhance the numbers, we built um, Conifer Estates that we opened in 2012, which is 20 units for homeless families. and. Uh, Right when we opened, we had a waiting list of 100 families. And so that's another piece of evidence that the need is really great, um, in spite of the fact that there's been some significant efforts to address the issue. Is there continue to be as much as a waiting list? I know that I saw that It too. stays pretty solid, stays yeah. Solid. Okay. And there are some other existing programs and shelters in place. I know that like the Village of Hope, that's the emergency family shelter. Yep. You've got the shelter, the Red Lake shelter. Servants of Shelter is the wintertime program where the churches open their doors. Um, you also have People's Church takes in what they can, yep. as many as they can. Um, but it, the needs assessment showed that it's still just a small percentage of people that are able to secure an emergency bed when they need it. That's right. really accurate. Oh. I think, um, you know, the project we're talking about doing in Bemidji is going to be 60 units or 60 apartments. Um, that's just... Uh, a drop in the bucket compared to the needs. And uh, I guess, you know, I, I would talk about um, a, a true story. When on one of our trips over, um, 
one of my colleagues was stopping at one of the reservations. And as she came out of the meeting, I was waiting in her car for her. And she said, let's take her on, ride around the back. And I said, why is that? And it was 20 below zero that day. And there were people living in the woods behind the, behind the building that she was coming out of. And that was a family. Oh, it's amazing if you think of what, what they must face and what they must live through just to get through day to day. So let's start talking specifically about this project. It's called the Park Place Apartments, yes. is that correct? It's going to be built in the railroad corridor, is that the plan? It's at the west end of the rail corridor, okay. um, just east of Park Avenue and south of 3rd Street. Okay. And the land was donated, correct, by the city? The city provided the building parcel, which was great. We've had such incredible alignment and support. Um, that um, it's made the project really a lot of fun to be part of. Awesome. I, I guess I'd just echo that. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we've done projects in a number of communities, and the the support here in Bemidji has been head and shoulders um, above any project we've done anyplace else. We in other communities we've met resistance. Um, we had to, in St. Cloud, we had to sue the city of St. Cloud to get a building permit to build our building, oh, wow. and, and we won. I had a death threat on myself in, in St. Cloud, and here everybody has really chimed in and worked together, um, and we could go down the list. You know, it's, Saint, uh, it's um, Beltrami County Human Services. It's the city of the, um, Bemidji. It's Tim's organization. It's the three tribes that we're working with. It's law enforcement. It's the other service providers. Um, it's just been incredible. Oh, that's amazing. That's got to be a positive experience, not just for you, but then when it is operating for hopefully the people who will be using it. Yes. So let's talk. I know you said there's going to be 60 units, but yes. there's a difference between one, one wing and another wing. Do you want to expand a little bit sure. on that? Sure. Um, when we did our needs study, we, we realized that um, there was a huge need for housing for chronic alcoholics. Okay. Um, and we, we saw them every day when we drove into town. Um, and we also knew that there was a huge, we learned that there's a huge need for people that their primary um, challenge is not alcoholism, but they've, they've been chronically homeless for years and years and years. And we had to decide how we were going to build the building. Um, we always talk about, you know, what's the critical mass we need, and we need usually at least 50 units to build a building. Okay. Um, and our original thought was that we would do um, 30 units of each, as I recall, Tim. And then we shifted based on the funding to 40 and 20. Okay. So we're going to have 20 what's called SRO, single residency occupancy units okay. for chronic alcoholics with a program for, for those folks, a housing program. And then 20 units that are efficiency units with small kitchens for people that are, are otherwise homeless. Okay. And we're assuming that a number of those folks will have other challenges like mental health issues, um, again, chronic homelessness, uh, okay. physical disabilities, those kinds of things. So the 40 units are those are more intense service they, they don't they don't have their own kitchens right there's they're more of a communal well I, I don't know if I'd say they're communal but um, what we do is we provide uh, we're gonna have a commercial kitchen and we provide three squares a day for the folks living in that side of okay. the building um, because they probably would have difficulty cooking in their own units okay. um, the the model we work from is called permanent supportive housing and we talk about a housing first philosophy so we get people their housing first, and then we talk about harm reduction. And um, the harm reduction comes in with people getting voluntary services. So if they want to make changes in their life, they can make those changes, and we help them do that. Okay, awesome. And as you reached out and started partnering with Center City, had you seen, like, heard anecdotally some results in terms of the success they've had in other communities that you're excited to see hopefully continue in Bemidji? Well, we took a, um, the Northwest Minnesota Foundation sponsored a bus tour, and we loaded the bus and took a bunch of people over to view the new San Marcos project. And um, we not only got to see the facility and had a really nice tour, we got to meet some of the residents and have a conversation with them about how the building was working for them. And uh, it was a pretty eye-opening and remarkable experience getting to talk to people whose, it, it was just obvious how much their lives had changed by the fact that they had stable housing. One of the women that we met with that was uh, particularly noteworthy is uh, she had actually lived in the part of the building as one of the chronic inebriate residents. And when we met her, she was living on the other side of the building um, oh, okay. and um, uh, had kind of put that part of the problem behind her. She still needed the affordable housing, but um, her, life had been, her life had been changed dramatically by not only the physical uh, building, but by the services that she had had access to 
and um, it was a pretty heartwarming experience and it started making people think about um, how relevant that type of an approach would be here. Oh, great. great. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about um, one of the early meetings that we had, that you folks had here in Bemidji. Um, Minnesota Housing, our funder, had a dialogue in Bemidji um, and they brought in all kinds of community stakeholders and they brought in um, business people and they talked about the needs here. And um, the Commissioner Tingerthal, who's the, the head of Minnesota Housing, um, was so impressed that the business community showed up in spades to the meeting and was so vocal about the needs standing homelessness here in the community that I think it really um, turned her head and made her really think about looking at us doing a project here. Oh, wow. Is that unique to Bibichi? Have you seen that kind of support and kind of branching out at other communities you've gone? I, I've not seen that kind of support. Okay. Um, you know, usually we have to convince the business community that they've got an issue mm -hmm. and um, that we can help with that issue. But here in Bemidji, um, again, they had a special breakfast and it was well attended and everybody was in support of the project. Oh, that's great. That's great. Tell us a little bit about how the staffing will be for the, for the facility because I, I think I read it's going to bring in some jobs as well. Yeah, there will probably be about 17 full-time equivalents. Okay. Um, we'll staff the building 24-7. There will be a, a minimum of two staff people in the building around the clock mm -hmm. um, to help folks. Um, we will have a, a site director. That's the person that uh, supervises the programs and the staff. Um, we found the need for a nurse and we'll have a part-time nurse on, on the staff um, helping people um, manage their medications and, and deal with routine issues that otherwise they might go to the hospital for, um, connecting with primary physicians. We'll have front desk staff, so um, it, if a person's coming to visit somebody, they'll have to check in at the front desk when they come in. We, this is not gonna be Animal House. Um, we're, we will ask those per people to give us identification. We'll make a copy of the identification so we know who's in the building at all times. All um, we'll have what we call um, health advocates or case managers, and those folks will help um, connect people with the services they need outside of the building. So if uh, a chronic alcoholic wants to work on their sobriety and they want to go to AA meetings, that person will help them connect with AA meetings. Or if the, that person wants to um, think about getting into treatment, that person will help the person. Um, and the same with mental health. We'll more than likely have a mental health case manager in the building. Um, we'll also help with transportation, and, and that's a real common sense thing. But um, we've, our experience has been that when we have had transportation, and if there's somebody that's struggling out in the community and we can go pick them up, it's, it makes things really efficient for the person, bringing them home, but it also helps law enforcement. And um, typically in the communities we've been in, um, law enforcement is a little bit leery about coming in and having a building where p uh, chronically homeless people and chronic alcoholics are, are able to drink in the privacy of their own homes, uh, their own units, and we've turned law enforcement around where they're some of our strongest supporters. And it's because we're helping not only the people, but we're helping them make their job better so they can do the things um, that are more important than dealing with, um, you know, uh, kind of nuisance kinds of issues in the community. I read somewhere in the research that I was doing or some of the literature I was reading that it decreases your law enforcement contact between these two groups by 80 to 85 percent, somewhere in that range? Yeah, we've, we've documented that in every community we've worked in. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. That's got to be great for the cops and then for also for the individuals. It is. Awesome. And the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also does the same for ER visits as well, doesn't it? As yes. Similar kind of statistics followed. Yep. A homeless person um, may use ER for housing on a cold night. Um, a homeless person may use an ER for something that is routine and that a, a neighbor could help with or a, a nurse could help with or somebody else could help with. And so we've seen dramatic reductions in, um, in the use of ERs in uh, Rochester, our, our program looked at the uh, most um, chronic users of healthcare services, and they were averaging $156,000 a youth year worth of healthcare for each individual. And um, we've dropped that by 90 to 95%. Great, great. 
I want to talk a little bit about the model that Center City has used because there is something that stuck out in one of the videos I was watching that there's five rules, right? There's five main rules at play for all the residents. Could you expand on those? Well, again, they're common sense rules. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to um, get along with their neighbors and we want people to pay their rent on time and people will contribute. If they have any income, they will contribute to the cost of their stay. I should mention that in um, Bemidji, the 20 units of efficiency units for homeless people are going to have Section 8 support from the um, Bemidji HRA, and we couldn't do it without that. Um, but th th again, I, I can't just rattle off the five sure, um, sure. rules, but yep. they're common sense rules. Mm -hmm. Get along with your neighbor and uh, pay your rent on time mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. go from there. Awesome. Um, what is HRDC's role then in, in the development of the complex moving forward? Do you have another role as it, as it gets developed? We don't really have a specific role. Our, our primary role has been um, because we staffed the HRA and they were passionately supportive of this project, we wanted to make sure that we had a role. And our role has been to support this project, try to serve to the best of our ability to be a community liaison, and to try to help um, Center City do some of the local legwork because we're here and there in Duluth. Um, so we've tried to facilitate that a little bit. Okay. Um, and we just, we, we are as passionate about this as they are, so we want to make this project successful. And I would say the partnership has just been incredible. Oh, that's great, that's great. What's your timeline then? So you're gonna break ground this spring, correct? We, um, we learned in October that we were going to get the funding okay. from Minnesota Housing. And now our next step is to move towards that financial closing. Okay. And that means a lot of paperwork and it means attorneys and it means surveys and it means all kinds of stuff. And that takes uh, between six and nine months. Okay. So from October to probably June or later, okay. um, we'll be working on that and then we'll do the financial closing. We've selected a general contractor. It's a, a local contractor, it's Krauss Anderson. Okay. Um, they've got a great reputation and uh, we're looking forward to working with them. Um, and then we'll break ground in August and it'll take about 10 months to build the building. Okay. So it'll be operational then, if everything goes according to plan, then next year? Yes. Okay. Great. Could you talk a little about the details for the funding? It's, you got the funding from Minnesota Housing, correct? And yep. it's an $11 million yes. project, correct? Yes. Okay. And then how does the operating budget kind of come together? You talked that, about all the services. That's a great mm -hmm. question. Uh, you know, when I think about budgets, I think, think about it in three buckets. Mm -hmm. And it's the capital to build the building, and we, we work that all out. Okay. Um, and then we've got the operating, which is like any other apartment building, so it's heat and lights and insurance and maintenance and all those kinds of things. And we've gotten help, again, from the HRA with the 20 units of um, Section. Section 8. That helps with the operations cost. And we also got, got help from um, the Beltrami County Department of Human Services, and they helped us secure uh, 40 beds of what's called GRH, Group Residential Housing Funding. And that's a, a program out of the state where Beltrami County works, acts as the conduit. And that pays, um, it's, that's got two components. One is called part one, go figure, and the other is part two. Um, the part one pays again for the operations and part two pays for the supports. Okay. And we do have a bit of a funding gap um, but we're, we're working on it. We've, got, um, we've gotten um, some help already. We've got applications out to some local foundations. Um, we're gonna have an application into United Way and those kinds of things, and we're confident that we're gonna fill that gap. Okay. But um, that's really kind of the last piece of the funding. Okay. And then what's the application process, or how do you find the residents, or will they find you, or are they referred, or how does that kind of come together? You know, probably about 60 days before we're ready to open, we will begin doing what we call outreach. Okay. And we'll be talking with the existing service providers here in the community. Tim's organization will help us do that, and we'll figure out who the people are. Um, you know, we're gonna have a strong emphasis on working with the tribes, so we'll do outreach um, on the reservations. And um, we're not gonna have any problem finding people. The, the law enforcement knows who the people are. Um, the emergency rooms know who the people are. Probably the judges know who mm -hmm. the people are. So that'll be um, really a, one of the easier tasks. And I don't mean to play it down. There will be a lot of paperwork involved and all that kind of stuff, but um, it should go really, really smoothly. Well, you know the need is there. Yes. And you know that there's people who need a bed. Yes. Okay. Once this opens, Will this solve the problem? Is this it? I mean, is this, do you get this open and then there's, we've got all the homeless housed or is there, <laughs> do you still have more work to go here in Bemidji? 
there's definitely more work to do, and um, I don't know if you ever, um, uh, you know, cross it off your list and go home and say, yeah, we've totally succeeded. Um, but there's already been discussion about, um, you know, uh, the HRA has discussed at least, how do we think about doing another phase of the conifer estates type development where we can provide additional housing for um, homeless families with kids. And, um, um, and if that is successful, it won't be 100%. We'll still have to be thinking about, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we get our arms around this really big issue and, um, um, but I think I, what I want to try to focus on is the fact that each of these projects does provide a significant difference, and I think it's going to be significantly better. Um, once this project open, opens up, I believe that we're going to have a noticeable difference in the homeless population, in, especially as we think about the core downtown Bemidji area. It'll be dramatic. It'll be immediate. Um, but it won't solve the issue. I, I believe that after we open this building, there will not be an issue with homeless chronic alcoholics to speak of, but I think there's still a need for more single housing for singles. Um, and there's for sure a need for homeless people that are coming out of the correction system. Absolutely. One of the things I saw in one of the literature I, I was reading was that once people get into your building, sometimes they they don't necessarily always stop drinking, but they might switch from some of the harder, the more harmful sub, uh, uh, substances to something more like beer. Vodka to beer, I think, was the one I saw. We encourage that. Okay. Um, that's part of this whole harm reduction. We're trying to reduce the health risk and the health harm. And, it, you know, it's, it's not vodka, necessarily even vodka to beer. It might be shaving lotion or mouthwash oh. to okay. beer or, okay. or to wine um, because those are really, really dangerous. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight on our program. I appreciate all the information, and we look forward to not only seeing the building once it's up and oper operational, but to seeing what comes later if they're down the road in the future. It's been our pleasure. Thanks, yes. Bethany. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching Lakeland Currents tonight. Again, I'm Bethany Wesley. Please join us next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.